Thank you for once again making time, this time at a, a late afternoon session. This is the last of our series of interviews for candidates for the position in the Center for Glial Biology. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jessica Bolton. Uh, Jessica grew up in Texas, uh, got her undergraduate degree in, at Southwestern University in Texas, and then went to Duke for her PhD to work with uh, Stacey Bilbo and uh, has been for the last five years at UC Irvine with Tally Barham as a postdoc. For the last 10 years, really starting with her PhD work, Jessica has uh, taken a great interest in microglia, the resident uh, immune cells of the brain, if you will. Uh, and there's been a lot of excitement about microglia well beyond you know, them uh, being an immune cell, but really being involved in synaptic plasticity, synaptic pruning and whatnot. So some of her work actually uh, uh, touches on that. For her PhD work, she became interested to look at how prenatal stressors uh, might affect postnatal development. And she had a paradigm where she was uh, exposing uh, mice to fumes, diesel fumes, um, and, in, and in conjunction, p feeding them, but well, that is pregnant mice, right. and, and, and in addition, putting them on a high-fat diet and look at the offsprings and surprisingly found that there was widespread inflammation and microglial activation, and that this actually went along with anxiety phenotypes, particularly in a sex difference, particularly strong in, in males versus females. Um, she continued that interest in, you know, uh, susceptibility of early life stressors to, to behavior uh, in Tally Barham's lab, looking now specifically at emotional disorders and depression. And there she's been focusing, and she's certainly going to talk about that today, but the role of corticotrophin releasing hormone uh, that accompanies, you know, anhedonia or a display of depression. Uh, she was targeting CHR with SHRNA and was able that she could actually rescue uh, animals from a depression behavior uh, um, and really providing the first evidence that this is necessary and sufficient for depression in animals. She has written a K99 that, that extends this work into looking at the role of microglia in, in reshaping synaptic circuitries related to say, CRH release in the hippocampus and, and amygdala. Uh, Jessica has been incredibly prolific. She published 20 papers, 12 of those as a first author. Uh, she served as a mentor uh, on an NSF research experience for undergraduates. Uh, at Duke in the summer and won the Dean's Award for Excellence in Mentoring uh, as a graduate student in 2015. She's been supported throughout her career with grants as an undergraduate uh, and, a, and, and a graduate student with NSF, uh, with an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship as a postdoc with the George Hewitt Foundation Fellowship. She recently won uh, a NARSA Young Investigator Award, and she won a K-99 Transition to Independence Award. So she had a really good year. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to her talk. Jessica. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> it's a very kind introduction, um, and I'm happy to be here today. So uh, also, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I wanted to make sure anyone that, you know, if, they, if I I'm not clear, please ask. Um, I'd be happy for this to be more interactive. Uh, so as Harry alluded to, I'll be speaking mostly about my postdoctoral work in Tally Barham's lab at U University of California, Irvine today, focusing on early life adversity or stress and how it shapes circuits. How might microglia be involved in this process? Um, so all of you are familiar with the idea of nature versus nurture. Um, we know that it's not either or, it's both, right? So genes and environment are interacting to influence brain function, really, cognitive emotional function throughout your life. Um, and as Harry also alluded to, I, I've studied anything from very physical factors in the environment, like air pollution, um, through to psychosocial stress, uh, you know, what we can model in a mouse or a rat. Um, and what really allows the interaction of the ge genetics and environment is this epigenetic mechanistic piece that you can, you can investigate how um, the environment is changing the way the genome is getting expressed. Right. Um, so what's especially important in my line of work is that the period of de development and uh, extreme plasticity um, is, really, is really a critical time when the environment can have that bigger influence on, on brain function later, as well as uh, brain circuitry wiring during development. 
Um, so I wanted to emphasize here that it's not genetics alone that can explain some of these recent uh, spikes we're seeing in things like uh, emotional disorders like depression. Um, also opioid abuse, the opioid abuse epidemic uh, is another one where it, it can't just be genes that are leading to these uh, vulnerabilities. It's more likely that there are environmental factors that have changed in the recent uh, decades to increase our risk. Um, so in my current lab, in, the po in my postdoc, we've really been honing in on what are these early life experiences that can affect your risk versus resilience to mental disorders. Um, so you can focus on the good side of things, optimal early life experiences, um, which often lead to resilience for different mental disorders, such as anxiety, depression, um, ADHD, schizophrenia, a lot of uh, various uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, and on the other hand, you can focus on the bad, so chronic early life adversity, um, which leads to risk for depression, addiction, lower cognitive abilities, among other um, outcomes. Not many of them are good. Um, so to take a step back, we know, of course, that the brain is organized as circuits or networks uh, whose function is what underlies these complex behaviors that make up things like your risk for depression, right? Um, so if we zoom in to the level of a single neuron in these circuits or networks, we can then ask what's happening, what is that neuron saying? What genes is it transcribing? Um, so you can look at the level of genetics again. But really, you know, the fundamental unit of these circuits is the synapse, right? So these connections between different brain regions. Um, so we're very interested in how synapses are changing and how that can lead to changes in circuit development um, that then uh, causes long-term changes in behavioral outcomes. Uh, and of course, I alluded to this earlier, but early in life is when there's a high degree of plasticity. So circuits are immature. They're still forming. Um, so the question in my lab is, do early life experiences influence circuit maturation? Um, and that's a very broad question that we're addressing in a lot of different ways. But when I came into the lab, I really wanted to ask the question um, that no one else was asking at the time, um, do microglia have a role in these early life experiences or environmental factors influencing circuit maturation? Uh, and Harry spoke a little bit about my PhD work, but I had been uh, involved in Stacey Bilbo's lab, really uh, setting up this model of prenatal air pollution exposure, combining with early life stress, how it impacts microglial development, um, neuroinflammation, as well as behavioral outcomes later in life. Um, so I had a lot of experience working with microglia, and I'd noticed, uh, as others had around this time, that microglia are really entering the brain early on. This is prenatally really around day nine of gestation. Uh, and they begin to interact with neurons quite early on. Um, so you can see the, the colocalization and overlap between these cell types in uh, red and green here. Um, but really some exciting work came out in the middle of my PhD work. Uh, from Beth Stevens' lab, Dory Schaefer showed that uh, microglia do regulate synapse number in the developing brain via this process called synaptic pruning. Um, so you can see in red and blue dots are synaptic puncta that are labeled inside the volume of the microglial cell in green. Uh, and what's interesting is that there's a sensitive or critical period during which this engulfment or pruning process is higher, um, and that's around P5 for the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus that they were studying. It really decreases by P9 and is, very, is even lower by P30. So during this developmental window could be when you would see changes in microglial pruning that would make a difference on synaptic rewiring. Um, so again, going back to my work, uh, we wanted to explore directly how early life adversity is influencing circuit maturation. Um, so about 20 years ago, uh, my boss invented this really cool paradigm, um, which we think is ethologically relevant, naturalistic, um, and also very translational. Uh, and there's a 
few reasons for that that I'll get into later. Um, but basically, she invented this paradigm called the limited bedding and nesting uh, model, or an impoverished environment. Uh, so you just simply give the animal about half the amount of nesting material, this white fluffy cotton that you can see, um, compared to the control in the top cage here. Um, and you know we also put this mesh between the corn cob bedding and the nesting material because the moms will compensate for um, the lack of cotton material by building with the uh, corn cob. So that's just a technical thing. But um, in the end, what we get is that this early life adversity, or ELA, increases corticosterone, or the canonical stress hormone, in our pups at P9, which is about the end of this experience. Um, and this is uh, conducted postnatal days two through nine. Um, and it's a chronic, uh, again, housing condition throughout this critical first week of life, approximately. Um, so what's interesting is that this, this increased uh, stress hormone level does persist into adulthood. It's not just right after the experience is over. Um, so it does seem like these animals are programmed or um, their stress responses change long term. And what comes along with that, you know, not just the court changes, but there's also a vulnerability to later stress. There's anhedonia, which we've identified more recently. Um, cognitive deficits, which are hippocampus dependent, is something that we've looked at um, many years uh, in the life of this model, as well as progressive cognitive decline. So we've um, collaborated with some folks that did uh, Alzheimer's, uh, different transgenic mice that mimic Alzheimer's uh, progression. And early life adversity animals have uh, a more uh, early and rapidly severe onset of, of cognitive decline. So to give you an overview today of what I'll be speaking to you about, um, basically the general flow chart here is that early life adversity is leading to changes in synapses, especially excitatory synapses, onto stress sensitive neurons. Um, this is then changing uh, epigenetic programming of these neuronal populations, which then can lead to stress circuit maturation changes, as well as susceptibility to stress related emotional disorders like anhedonia. And as I alluded to, uh, I think that microglial synaptic pruning is playing an important role up the chain here, um, transcribing or uh, translating, so to speak, the early life adversity signal to affect microglial function and then change the, the synaptic um, number and function that we see on our stress-sensitive neurons. Um, taking another step back here just to get everyone on the same page, the, how the brain responds to stress is, of course, known as uh, the stress response system or the HPA axis, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, but just to zoom in here on the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, there's a nice uh, hub of CRH producing or corticotropin releasing hormone producing neurons, um, which is really one of the first signals that then goes down to the pituitary gland, and this causes the release of ACTH into the bloodstream, leading to the release of cortisol or corticosterone in the rodent um, from the adrenal gland. So this is the canonical stress response pathway. And I'll be focusing today really on that paraventricular nucleus, kind of that first node of the pathway here that I showed you. Um, and I will be showing you a lot of images with red, beautifully labeled TD tomato CRH uh, expressing neurons. Um, so keep in mind that red equals CRH neurons. Uh, and green, in this case, is really just a validation to show you that with um, CRH labeling, that this overlaps really nicely with um, our, our transgenic mouse line. Um, and, you know, really when we look at the synapses on these CRH neurons um, that are in red on the left, they're going to change in a second, but on the left they are red. If you, again, are thinking about this optimal early life experience, um, really nice maternal care, um, you get what, what turns out to be reduced excitatory transmission onto these CRH-expressing uh, neurons. So in the control, you can see that there are um, more green VGLUT2 positive puncta onto these red CRH neurons than there are in the augmented maternal care condition down below. Um, so you get a decreased number of excitatory synapses with 
this optimal experience. And it's exactly the opposite when you look at the early life adversity condition. Um, now the neurons are shown in blue, so it changes. Uh, we have CRH expression or CRH uh, peptide in green. And we also have the VGLUT2 now in red, so don't get mixed up by the colors. Um, but we have far more VGLUT2 um, uh, puncta on the CRH neurons after this chronic early life adversity experience, so the opposite of that optimal experience. And importantly, it's not just at the structural level. We do have functional electrophysiological data showing that this matches up. If you look at, um, oops, where's my pointer? If you look at the augmented experience, we see decreased excitatory postsynaptic currents, decreased frequency, I should say, um, after uh, this early life experience that's optimal, and we have, again, that decreased number of synapses, so decreased EPSCs. Um, and when you look at the early life adversity condition, it's, again, the exact opposite, where we have more higher frequency of these EPSCs after early life adversity. So structurally and functionally changed by these early life experiences. Yeah, question. So we've looked mostly at CRH neurons because they are the, again, that kind of first node of the stress response. They are stress sensitive, and they also create stress signals. So that's why we're focusing on them. Um, and when we've looked, we've done um, mostly, again, the focus on the CRH neurons. But um, we think that it is specific if you compare to whole tissue versus, uh, versus CRH neurons. It's different. So, um, so there's, there's some indication. but. It would be good to also look at other specific populations, um, which would be a future direction for sure. Um, good question. Yeah. Uh, can you describe the optimal care conditions, or is that just Yeah. Yeah. So, good question. I was going to come back to it later, but um, but it's basically increased levels of licking and grooming induced by handling or very brief maternal separation, the Michael Meany paradigm. If you, yeah, if you know. <laughs> um, good question. So uh, basically what I've been telling you is that all of these changes are happening and eventually this leads to changes in CRH expression in the CRH neurons in the PVN. So they're being programmed by early life experiences. Um, so here on the augmented care side, you can see decreased CRH expression after, after this augmented care compared to control. And Again, we have behavioral changes that go along with these uh, uh, peptide changes. So after restraint stress, the animals that got augmented care early in life have a much diminished response to stress, so a lower court response. Um, and so they're thought to be more stress resilient in this case. Um, and along with this court response, we also show decreases in anxiety-like behavior, decreases in depression-like behavior. Um, so there's a lot of other good things that come along with this. Um, and one of the first projects I got involved with in the lab uh, as a new postdoc was really helping this really massive undertaking get through to publication. Um, and it was a really exciting project basically showing that when you take the, uh, the CRH neurons and the PVN in vitro, you can take a nice little organotypic um, culture slice of this, of this environment, of just the PVN really, um, and you can treat with glutamate receptor blockers to mimic that decrease in uh, excitatory synapses that we see in vivo. And what you'll see is that you get a decrease in CRH expression just like you get in vivo. So we're able to mimic the in vivo increased licking and grooming, all of these wonderful things that mom's doing just by giving glutamate receptor blockers to our uh, organotypic slices. Yeah? Good question, yeah. So that's that's message on the top row, and this is protein down below. Yep. So so it is at both levels. Um, and uh, what this is showing is CRH levels as well as the number of CRH expressing cells is, is uh, decreased. Yeah? Uh, maybe you're going to get to this, but uh, <laughs> is, uh, is the change, do you think, uh, just an effect of the overall excitatory synaptic drive? Or right. Is some downstream signaling pathway, perhaps, a downstream NMJ receptor? Right. Good question. And I, I will get to kind of the epigenetic mechanism that we're thinking is involved in the very next slide. <laughs> so uh, hopefully this will answer your question. Um, 
So what we've shown, again, taking this in vitro and reducing this excitatory synaptic function is sufficient to induce a, a, a important transcription factor called NRSF or REST, you may have heard of. Uh, neuron, neuron restrictive silencing factor is uh, what NRSF stands for. Basically, this is a restrictive or repressive transcription factor that causes neuron-specific genes to be reduced in expression. Um, so really, people think about this transcription factor in um, basically gliogenesis. So when, when early neural stem cells are becoming either neurons or glia, this is really upregulated if a, if a neural stem cell is going to become an astrocyte instead of a neuron. Um, but what we've found in our lab, even in um, epilepsy, this, this transcription factor is upregulated in neurons, actually. So it's almost as if the neurons are almost de-differentiating, or not exactly that, probably, but reducing the expression of neuron-specific genes to protect themselves. Um, so this, this transcription factor is really interesting. We see it increase its binding to, um, or sorry, this is relative levels of NRSF. We see the levels of NRSF go up after we treat with those glutamate receptor blockers. Um, and when we look at the NRSF binding to CRH, the, one of the uh, NRSC or uh, binding sites in the CRH intron, this binding goes up after, again, those glutamate receptor blockers in vitro, but also in vivo at P10, so after the early life augmented care. Um, and of course, we don't think it's only CRH that's being changed. So there's a lot of other genes that um, are being bound by NRSF and changed after this change in glutamate receptor um, function. So we did the same thing with treating these uh, slices with glutamate receptor blockers, then uh, did a uh, ChIP-seq experiment where we targeted NRSF again and pulled down all of the, the genes that were being regulated by NRSF after this treatment um, versus control. And we found a lot of the suspects that you might think would be changed. So genes involved in synaptic signaling, um, ion transport, um, signal release, synaptic vesicle cycles. So all of these things that are co probably contributing to changes in neuronal function are being changed after uh, our glutamate receptor blocker treatment that again mimics our in vivo uh, augmented care. So all of that is just going to show that if these changes in synaptic innervation induced by early life experiences are so important, uh, then how are they occurring? So this is where I come in and really develop my own independent line of research in the lab, um, looking again at this candidate cell of microglial, uh, microglial changes after early life experiences. Um, so when I started this work, no one had really looked at microglia in the PVN. Um, so I had to do that to start with. Uh, and, you know, they're there. They, they come in prenatally, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So microglia are in green in these images, and our CRH neurons are in red, like I told you before. Um, so you definitely see microglia here in the PVN at, at postnatal day four, which is early in, our, um, in that critical first week of life that we're talking about. And then by P8, towards the end of that time period, What's interesting is, of course, they're still there, but we see more co-localization between these red and green cells, more overlap, so to speak, um, as time goes on. And that's only four days later, but as quantified here, in, excuse me, in the bar graph, uh, we do see an increased co-localization across time uh, during this critical first week of life. So really that P8 time period is gonna be something I come back to as more of an, an interesting time period to explore uh, functionally later on. So keep that in the back of your mind. Um, this slide is just to remind you, of course, that microglia do phagocytose excess weak synapses, so the ones that are not as um, firing as much or receiving as many signals early in life in the developing brain. Um, again, during these sensitive periods that for example, Beth Stevens showed P5 was one um, peak pruning period in the DLGN. Um, so, of course, no one had done similar experience, experiments in the PVN when I started this project, so I had to do them um, and show that microglia in this brain region do also have a role in synaptic pruning. 
Um, so we did some uh, experiments looking at just bluntly inhibiting microglia, uh, starting off with minocycline in vivo. This is a dirty drug, um, but it does grossly inhibit microglial activation. Uh, we treated in vivo subcutaneously P5 to P7 during this critical window that we think is important, and then looked at excitatory synapses on P8. So what we found is that when you inhibit microglia with minocycline, you see an increase in the number of VGLUT2 or excitatory puncta on these CRH neurons again. Um, so this is agreeing with our hypothesis that if we inhibit microglial function, we get uh, an inhibition of synaptic pruning and we get more synapses. Yeah? So this is a general question that I've had about this whole story. Okay. I'm here if you can Engulfment of what's left <laughs> uh -huh. is one thing. Right. The actual mechanism of identifying which synapse goes in which synapse right. is the same method. Right. And what, in your sense, is the best evidence for a causal link between the microglia being there? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, are they cooking the needle? <laughs> right. That's a great question. I don't think the field really has answered that fully yet. Um, I do think it's interesting that, uh, you know, in the work that Beth Stevens has done, she's shown that astrocytes play a role, for example, in C3 deposition onto synapses, specifically those weak synapses, microglia of the receptor for C3 and come along and remove those synapses. Um, Exactly. Yeah, it's possible. Or that suggestion, but right. There really isn't direct evidence. Right. Yeah, and I mean, knocking out different uh, receptors like C3 receptor in microglia, of course, again results in that increase in synapses. So they have a role, right? But yeah, we're. I think we're still working on defining it more fully. Good question. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to show you another experiment to complement that dirty drug of minocycline. Um, so we've really honed in more specifically here on uh, MER-TK, which is a mer tyrosine kinase receptor, something that's found in phagocytic cells and also astrocytes to some extent. Um, but in our hands, MER-TK is only expressed in microglia in the PVN at this time point. Um, so when we inhibit MER-TK, which is a phagocytic receptor, and then look at synapses, we find the same thing. So again, inhibiting phagocytosis by microglia increases the number of synapses, excitatory synapses in this case, in the PVN on CRH neurons more support for this uh, idea that inhibiting microglial function does result in more synapses. Um, and I just want to remind you that I showed you earlier that early life adversity also increases the number of synapses on CRH neurons in the PVN. Um, so I replicated this data in my own hands, showing you here what I found, that there's this increase in VGLUT2 um, and PSD90 positive uh, colocalization on CRH neurons um, at this time point after early life adversity. So putting those two things together, if early life adversity is resulting in an increase in synapses, um, and we know that microglia are pruning synapses at this time point, then maybe early life adversity is inhibiting microglial synaptic pruning uh, to result in this excess of synapses on our PBN CRH neurons. So first things first, you got to look at number of microglia, because maybe there's just more microglia out there pruning synapses, right? We do not see a change in the microglial number um, in our hands in after early life adversity. Um, this is at P10. It's also not different at P8 um, between these two groups. Now, we also don't see a difference in CRH neuron number, so it's not just that microglia are eating whole CRH neurons differentially uh, because of early life adversity. So I really, you know, wanted to get past that kind of gross level of inspection that a lot of the field had been focused on for so long, including in my PhD work, and really get more at function. Um, how are microglia impacting, or how are they interacting with uh, these PVN CRH neurons? And really the best method I found to go about doing that um, was live imaging. Uh, so two-photon imaging is something that um, we had a great strength 
in actually, uh, we have uh, Micah Halen on our campus at UC Irvine. He is well known for doing live T cell imaging in the spinal cord, in brain slices. Um, and so I knocked on his door and asked if he would train me in this technique. And he was kind enough to volunteer his postdoc, of course, <laughs> to train me in this technique. Um, and so that's what I did. I collaborated with Mike Halen and Ian Parker, who built our two photon microscope for this purpose. Um, and we used in these experiments, uh, in this video that you saw a little bit earlier, we're using P8, again, that special time point, um, it, double reporter mice, so CRH iris Cree positive, T tomato positive, CX3, CR1, GFP positive, triple transgenic male mice um, in this case. And uh, what we're doing is we're using a vibratome and slicing 320 micron acute slices, treating them as we would for electrophysiology, making sure everything stays alive and happy. Um, and we are, importantly, imaging quickly after sacrifice. So within one to two hours of sacrifice, collecting these 30-minute uh, videos. Because if you wait too long, the microglia start looking much angrier. Um, which, to those of you that have seen angry microglia, they become more amoeboid and they don't have these beautiful processes that are moving around, um, as you can see in this video. Um, and we also make sure that we go 50 microns at least below the surface of the slice, because you'll also find angry amoeboid microglia at the surface of the slice, but not so much below that surface where the, where the cut was. Um, so these videos are beautiful, of course, but what do we do with them is always <laughs> the question. How do you quantify them? These, these very complex videos looking at microglial movement and motility. Um, so one, one uh, technique I landed on was um, kind of a classical technique that had been used in our lab before, just a very simple chymograph, uh, which is built into ImageJ, actually. Um, and this is a method that allows you to create a time by distance plot uh, tracking the tips of processes of these microglia. Um, and what you can see here on this first row is that, for example, this cell starts out with a long extended process and then pulls that process in over time. And you can see that visually in the chymograph, the data that you get out of this process. Um, the tip is here on the right side, the base of the cell, uh, the cell body is on the left. Um, so this is the distance on the x-axis and time is on the y-axis. So starting with frame one, which is at the top, we then go down, and as the frames add up, we pull in that microglial process to have um, a much shortened process by the end of this video. Um, the opposite happens in the bottom row here, where the process isn't there so much to begin, but then it grows out over time in the chymograph and then pulls back in at a later frame. Um, so these are nice visual plots of what's happening in a very simplistic way in the microglia. Um, and what you can do is, uh, with our ImageJ plugin, uh, use some fancy calculus, of course, to get the total distance of this dotted line, um, get the total velocity, put it over time. Um, and what's amazing is that undergrads are really good at this. So they have to, <laughs> they have to manually trace these processes, which is one limitation of this technique. Um, but they're, they're really productive, and they can, they can do this process quite easily, um, which is great. So I've trained a whole host of them now to do this, and we've collected a lot of data showing that uh, the early life adversity condition, these microglial processes are not moving as much as in the control animals. Um, and this is, again, over those 30-minute videos. We just see less total distance moved by the microglial process tips. Um, and so, of course, I'm not happy with just one approach showing me that. I would like to. Uh, find a corresponding approach that would show in an independent way, hopefully, the same pattern. So to do this, we recruited a really awesome, enthusiastic, um, rotating graduate student, Jacqueline Beck, who had previously worked at NASA. And she had a lot of experience with uh, image analysis of satellites and these fun things. So she was gung-ho. And within 10 weeks, she was able to create a uh, more automated skeletonization process for us in Python. So what she did was she started with the raw video, which you can see on the left, one frame. Then what she did was to binarize uh, that, that frame, 
create an automated skeletonization of these microglial processes, which unfortunately results in some gaps that you can hopefully appreciate here because of the differences in fluorescence intensity. So what she applied to fix that problem is called a minimum spanning tree algorithm. Um, and what that does is finds the most likely connection between those bits of uh, hanging out microglial processes that you see. Um, and that does a really great job of connecting faithfully the processes in the way that they are in vivo. Um, and so then she can take all of the frames in the video and analyze each of these skeletons um, across time. So what was exciting is even with a smaller amount of data or videos that met the criteria necessary for automa automated analysis, um, she found the same pattern of decreased microglial motility or velocity of our processes after early life adversity. Um, so now we feel more confident suggesting that this microglial function is diminished or decreased by early life adversity. Uh, and so now you might be wondering, what about synapses? Um, so we went in and uh, did the canonical engulfment assays that um, have been brought up, and some, similar to uh, Beth Stevens lab. So basically what you do is use Amaris to do 3D reconstruction of microglial volumes. Um, you include a stain for synaptic markers, such as VGLUT2 in our case, our excitatory uh, marker that we've been using. Um, and then you see how many of those VGLUT2 punct are inside of your microglial volume. Um, and what we found, um, interestingly enough, is that there is a decrease in the number of VGLUT2 puncta inside microglia after early life adversity, which lines up with that decreased movement that we're seeing of processes and suggests, again, that there's a diminished function of our microglia after early life adversity. Now, what we're also doing, of course, to correspond with this as our second method is we're collaborating with Maria Tremblay's lab, who uh, she's at Laval currently, but she's move moving to British Columbia. She might have already moved, actually. But what I, I went over the summer to visit her um, under the auspices of my K99 grant and learned how to do some of this really exciting EM uh, analysis that she does looking at uh, microglial engulfment or surrounding um, these uh, synaptic elements. Um, so that was a really great experience. Um, and basically, what was exciting when we continued doing this work was that just as I showed you Beth Stevens' um, data showing this critical period of engulfment, we have a similar pattern in our data where, um, again, this, there's this difference in engulfment um, at P8 between the two groups, and there's a high amount of engulfment in the control animals. But by the time you get to P30, it's much diminished. Um, so again, there's that sensitive period or window where uh, microglial synaptic pruning is more active, uh, specifically here in the PBN. Um, now, Beth Stevens also looked at the role of complement, as we just talked about a little bit ago. And this is uh, an eat me synaptic tag, as they've coined, coined it. Um, and it has a corresponding receptor, C3 receptor, uh, which is composed in part, at least, by CD11B, or ITGAM is another uh, name for it. Um, and what we found in our data is that we, even in this very preliminary qPCR analysis, we have a trend for a decrease in C3 expression um, in whole tissue. Uh, of the PVN, and we also have a decrease in uh, C3 receptor, um, which is only expressed by microglia in, in the brain. So suggesting that this complement receptor pathway and complement uh, tagging of weak synapses may be involved in the early life experience um, changes that we are seeing in our studies. Um, so just to recap what I've showed you so far, early life adversity is causing uh, a diminished amount of microglial synaptic pruning, which then leads to this increased excitatory innervation of stress-sensitive CRH neurons. Um, and that is sufficient, as I showed you at the beginning, to cause altered epigenetic programming of these neuronal populations. Um, and now I'll tell you a, a, a story really focusing more on the stress circuit maturation and the final behavioral outcome of uh, susceptibility to anhedonia specifically. Um, so Harry alluded to this study a little bit in my introduction as well. Um, this was, again, one of the earlier projects I was involved on in the lab um, prior to my K99. So this project was asking the question of, does early life adversity alter stress circuit maturation? And it was published uh, about a year ago now in Biological Psychiatry. Um, and 
really the initial observation that was exciting. Oh, yeah. So if you look at the reduced synaptic yes. input, can you drive it the other way into the microglia follow? So, so we have reduced uh, synaptic input in the augmented, yeah, maternal yeah. care. So yeah, we, that would be a future direction. I have not yet done that. Yeah, I mean, but you know, that sort of loss and gain of function right. approach really is powerful. Yeah, exactly. No, I totally agree. Um, so I have that at the end of my talk for sure. Um, but going back to the early life adversity model, we one of the exciting things we found more recent in more recent years was that um, these animals do show what we could call anhedonia-like symptoms. You have a question? Yeah, it was just about the mushrooms. Sure. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. Pruning happens according to as these cells start getting exposed to light and yeah. activity. Sure. And so it's kind of it's easier in that way to correlate it back to humans. Mm -hmm. But what is happening in life for a mouse that the stress circuit could need to be reshaped right. at that age and how could that be related back to sure. Yeah, I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, the, the first week of life, the eyes aren't open yet. The animals are pretty immobile, pretty helpless. So they really re rely on mom a lot for, for input um, and all stimulation, basically. Licking and grooming is really important, which we've talked about. Um, but we think that that, er that early life, when they're so dependent on mom, is when uh, kind of the limbic reward circuits are, are being shaped by early life experiences. So I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Good question. Um, but basically here I'm showing you sucrose preference data or sucrose consumption data that is uh, illustrating that the early life adversity animals um, consume less sucrose after experiencing uh, an early life adverse, er, adversity situation, um, which is suggestive of anhedonia. Um, and really, we wanted to get at kind of the circuit mechanism of how this is happening. So what we did was we did some DTI imaging, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, MRI, in collaboration with um, some animal imagers at UC Irvine. We're very fortunate to have um, a very nice MRI machine specifically for animals and people that know how to do all of this stuff. Um, so we collaborated with Andy Obenaus and his group who does this for a living um, and really found some striking things where the early life adversity animals have what looks like increased numbers of these tracks or streamlines connecting two important uh, limbic regions of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala in this case. Um, so there's really this hyperconnectivity between these two regions, um, so to speak, uh, as shown by our diffusion streamlines or tracks. This needs to be verified, of course, with anatomical tracing, which we're doing now. Um, but we did see this increase in early life adversity animals uh, in the number of these tracks or streamlines on both sides of the brain. Uh, we also saw more tracks crossing the midline that connect these two regions, which is um, somewhat abnormal, as you can see in the figure. Um, so they're overall more disorganized um, and more of them. Yeah, question. So, the, sorry, this is adults. Yeah, so P60, approximately. How do you identify those tracks and distinguish them from other animals? Right, yeah, so this is all based on the, the movement of water molecules. So that's why I say it needs to be validated by um, track tracing. How do you know if some of these tracks which connect amygdala and prefrontal cortex are not the same? Right, so that's where the C, this is outside of my level of expertise, but they do seed uh, analyses where they start with the amygdala and then actually follow it all the way through to the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so, yeah. So is the brain the same size? Or the yes, that's an important thing to check. It is the same size in these animals. Yep, good question. So how do you interpret this? Right, so this could be, so again... Is it coming? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. If, if, the, if the brain is the same size, just at a simple level... Right. Sure, yeah, so this, this may suggest, again, that there could be less pruning. Um, it goes along potentially with the story I told you earlier. There's just hyperconnectivity potentially between these regions, um, which, again, we need to explore more, but this was kind of the initial finding um, that really actually led to the question of, uh, functionally, what does this mean, of course? Um, so we started to look 
not just at structural MRI analyses, but a more functional measure, in this case, the poor man's fMRI or FOSS analyses. Um, so what we did was we did a, a simple social play task. And this is in rats, by the way. They're very great at playing, mice not so much. Um, so they have this uh, period in adolescence and juvenile um, stages in their lives where they play a lot with peers. Um, and this is a very pleasurable and rewarding activity for normal rats. Um, but in our uh, early life adversity animals, not so much. Um, and what we found when we looked at their brains with this simple uh, FOSS um, assay, just looking at here the central nucleus of the amygdala, one region that popped out with a really um, interesting difference between the groups, we saw an increase in the number of FOSS cells after early life adversity compared to control, which we did not see at all in the neighboring basal lateral amygdala, so very close by. Um, and this is interesting because really the central nucleus is involved in stress and anxiety. Why are these animals playing, you know, having this uptick in FOSS activation in the amygdala? Um, Yes, we did. Um, and what we found was actually the opposite. I, we uh, put it in the supplemental, but it was actually pretty interesting because the, um, I forget, I think it was the infralimbic cortex, not the, media, not the um, prelimbic, but the, in the infralimbic cortex, it was specifically uh, a decrease in uh, FOSS activation. So potentially allowing this increase uh, in the amygdala, since some people think of the MPFC as a break on the, on the amygdala activation. But we didn't focus on it for this paper. Um, so here we wanted to know, of course, what neuron subpopulations are being activated aberrantly by this early life, uh, or sorry, this uh, social play experience. Um, and what we found when we stained for, when we dual labeled for CRH cells is that it does seem like a lot of these uh, FOSS labeled cells are CRH double positive as well. Um, so we're getting an increase in the early life adversity animals in CRH neurons being activated by a supposedly pleasurable event. Um, for some reason, they are activating this, this nucleus of the brain. Um, so the question is, of course, if we knock down CRH or we inhibit the, uh, these neurons from doing that, um, can we prevent the anhedonia that we see? Um, so what we did was we took an SHRNA approach that knocked down CRH, specifically in the uh, central nucleus of the amygdala. Um, and you can see the knockdown here, um, which is actually months later after the administration, and it's still there. You don't see it in the PVN, um, which is, of course, another CRH-dense region, um, but not near where the injection occurred. So it was specific. Um, and what we found behaviorally, uh, I should mention this design was really nice because we were able to do it within subjects. So we did uh, sucrose consumption analysis before giving them the shRNA. And then we also took an after measure uh, after we gave the shRNA to see the difference between um, before and after in the same animal. Um, and what's exciting, if you focus on C, is again that pre-shRNA versus post. You can see in the dark pink lines here, these are the animals that got control shRNA that doesn't knock down CRH. They are low, low with CRH consumption, and they, they stay pretty low, or they do not. But if you look at the purple or lilac color lines, those animals really have this steep increase from pre to post shRNA, um, knocking down that CRH actually increases or reverses um, that anhedonia that we saw in these animals prior to the shRNA. Just a little easy to say. Mm -hmm. Inject the shRNA in the amygdala. Yeah. Are there CRH neurons there? Oh yes, yes, a whole a whole host of CRH neurons there. Okay, so yeah, the that's what I was showed. Right, so there's enclaves of, P of CRH neurons in different parts of the brain. The amygdala and the PVN are really the most, one of the most dense regions. Um, PVT is another one. Um, but yeah, totally different um, story here. So, so anyway, we were able to reverse the anhedonia in these individual rats. Um, and what was cool is we also, again, took that second approach of looking at peer play in these animals that got shRNA. 
we weren't able to do before and after, but we, we did see that there was a decrease still in pure play behavior in the animals that got early life adversity and unrelated SHRNA, but this was rescued by the CRH SHRNA administration. Question back there. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's it's sucrose consumption and it's pure play. So those are those are um, defined as pleasurable events, of course, for a rat's life. That they will, you know, they'll press levers for these for access to playmates. They'll press levers for access to sucrose. So that tells us that these are things that they want and they desire. Um, but but yeah, of course, there's always the translational gap between these things. Um, what's nice about anhedonia is that we're not talking about depressive-like behavior overall, which I'll show you in a second. Um, it's really along these RDOT criterion lines that the NIH, NIMH is moving towards. Um, so we're moving away from the DSM, which isn't that great. It's really heterogeneous in terms of its disorder classification. Um, but we're moving to these more specific um, behavioral changes that we're talking about. So anhedonia is more specific than depression. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so then I'll just show you the control data that there's no change in social interaction, no change in uh, locomotion in these animals after shRNA or um, early life adversity. Um, and then this was what I was alluding to is when you do these more canonical depressive-like behavioral tasks like poor salt for swim tests, which is really rapidly falling out of favor in the community right now, um, this test does not detect any differences amongst our groups, um, which again, maybe because we're studying very specifically anhedonia that's changed in our animals, or maybe because this test isn't great, which is what NIMH is now arguing, that you can't write a grant that includes a horse swim test. Um, so anyway, uh, it, again, it's interesting that we have this more specificity, so to speak, to our anhedonia or uh, pleasure paradigm. Um, and that does extend beyond what I've showed you in this paper. So we recently published an, another paper in collaboration with Steve Mahler, an, a drug addiction expert at UC Irvine, who um, allowed our rats to self-administer cocaine. Um, and what he found is that these rats still have anhedonia, even when you let them self-administer cocaine freely. They prefer to have less of it in their bloodstreams. Um, so that's what this hedonic set point is. Um, also, when we let them consume M&Ms freely in their home cage, they don't eat as many of them. Um, so across these different modalities, uh, they're not preferring these uh, supposedly pleasurable um, experiences that normal control rats are, are um, chasing after. Uh, so just to sum up what I've showed you so far in the second part, uh, early life adversity, again, is leading to changes in excitatory synapses, which we presume is leading to these stress changes in stress circuit maturation and this eventual susceptibility to anhedonia. Um, but taking a step back up that chain, something I can just briefly uh, tell you is alluding to one of the previous questions that was asked. Um, so what is the signal from this early life adversity impoverished ex in environment to the developing brain? Um, and really, as I mentioned in the mice during this critical first week of life, there's this, um, this period where the most potent and relevant early life experience that baby is having is from the primary caregiver, right? So in this case, we're showing mom. In the rodents, it's mom. But it can also be dad, of course, in the humans. Um, so we think of the, the primary caregiver in this sense as the conveyor and buffer of environmental influences. Uh, so what we see in our impoverished environment cages when we take the time to very painstakingly observe what the mothers are doing in these environments, um, what we find is that there's a uh, decreased duration of each individual bout of these very important caregiving behaviors like licking and grooming for rodents. That's a critical behavior early in life. Um, it actually helps developmental processes. Uh, but overall, the total duration of this licking and grooming is not changed. So it's, again, about the pattern um, or fragmentation of these uh, behaviors. So we actually see more fragmentation because there's lower um, or smaller, shorter lengths of these behaviors occurring. 
to add to that, we also have unpredictability in the sequences of behaviors. So we have um, here in the control, we have higher probability, warmer colors on this probability scale of one behavior following another behavior with these different codes. Um, but we have cooler colors, which are lower probabilities for the early life adversity animals. So we have, again, unpredictability and um, basically chaos or uh, entropy is one term we've used for these, these uh, different changes. But um, the essential finding here is that early life adversity moms are not as predictable in their, in their behavior patterns as our control moms in response to this impoverished environment. So essentially what we think the developing brain is seeing, quote unquote, is chaos in this case. Um, so they can't see, of course, but what they're experiencing through this licking and grooming and nurturing behavior from mom is a disrupted pattern of early life signals from mom, which is critical for the development of these uh, stress sensitive circuits, of these reward circuits that we're studying. Um, so in our uh, work in basically my my advisor has this really awesome Connie Center grant through an IMH a P50 mechanism um, we're collaborating with uh, human researchers who are taking this work and translating it to humans and back again um, and you know what we're finding in human uh, infants that experience a high fragmentation of maternal care or interaction is also um, changes in reward circuitry in the brain, increased risk for anhedonia later in life. Um, and one kind of fun paper we wrote uh, that's just completely conjecture perspective uh, that was invited by neuropsychopharmacology is that one thing that might be introducing fragmentation into our modern lives is, of course, smartphone use. You guys have heard about this in other modalities, of course. but. Um, Parents, of course, have smartphones like the rest of us and are in interrupted, distracted as much as the rest of us. Um, and that could result in more fragmentation in uh, parent-baby interactions, was the hypothesis. Perfect. <laughs> it's a good rule to have. <laughs> so you're very fragmented and distracted if you are. Um, but that was just a fun paper we wrote recently. Um, and yet to be studied and confirmed in the human populations, but we'll get there. Uh, just to summarize here, I have listed in, filled in the papers that we've published recently on all of these pieces that I've showed you today. Um, and then, of course, highlighting the uh, microglial synaptic pruning piece, um, which is what I'll be taking with me to my future lab. Um, and basically, there are a lot of future directions to take this work. I'll just quickly list a couple of them, and we'll go deeper tomorrow during my chalk talk. Um, but there are, of course, a lot of mechanistic questions open here. So manipulating microglia to prevent the rewiring is the direction we're currently going. Um, investigating microglial transcriptomics and epigenetics that are changed which is part of my R00 grant. Um, and then, of course, are these functional changes in microglia transient or enduring is an important question. Um, and as someone asked, great question, uh, I would love to do the bi-directional approach and look at uh, the optimal early life experience side of things and see how microglia are involved in resilience to stress-related disorders as well. And I'll just go through that quickly. Um, so the idea would be that, that it would be the opposite, that optimal early life experiences would increase synaptic pruning to result in that diminished number of synapses that we see on CRH neurons. Um, and then there's some really interesting sex differences in this model that I uh, ha haven't told you about yet, but basically female rats do not experience anhedonia after early life adversity, which our males definitely do. That's all the data I've shown you. Um, so that would be an important direction to go in the future to see why that's the case. Um, and then finally, the role of microglia in sculpting other vulnerable circuits, such as the central nucleus of the amygdala, which was that second story, the medial prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens. Um, and we've also started looking at other drugs, such of course, of course opioids, um, which interestingly, female rats have increased opioid addiction-like behavior. So that's another very cool sex difference we're finding um, and something that needs to be followed up further. Um, but I'd just like to end with um, an acknowledgement of all the wonderful mentors I've had uh, throughout my training, Stacey Bilbo, uh, my graduate lab, the Bilbo Lab, and then, of course, the Barham Lab pictured in the uh, large photo here. Uh, Tally Barham has been a wonderful mentor. Uh, I've had a 
team of undergrads that I alluded to. Uh, this is just a small group of them that I've mentored throughout my time as a postdoc, um, but they've been really helpful in moving this research forward. Uh, the Kahalen Lab are collaborators um, at the Connie Center, all my funding, um, and with that, I will take any questions if there's time. <laughs> <laughs> but my lab, one of the projects it works on is looking at patterns of stimulation in the brain. And oh, cool. Yeah. So we look not just at frequency, but temporal order structure. Yes. And chaos it's important. And yes. And so the time scale we work on, mm -hmm. those types of experiments are seconds. Okay. Maybe a couple minutes. Right. I was, when I was looking at your licking, grooming yeah. data, it got me thinking about um, similar sort of thing. But the time scales are greater. Yeah. And so what you have me thinking about is <laughs> what's the integrator circuit in the brain? Yeah. I, I, I can kind of sort of get a handle on what our lab does about from a synaptic plasticity integrator circuit, those time scales. But here, um, something somehow yep. is detecting over some longer period of time whether I, the animal, received regular or irregular right. in your grooming. And, yeah. And, and that raises some really interesting questions. Anyway, I don't have an answer. I don't know. I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> Yeah. How you're thinking that might work. Sure, yeah, and it, we think the paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus is actually a key node where um, we've seen it, uh, boss activation is increased after these licking and grooming bouts um, in the augmented care, for example. Uh, and we're also, s now people are really characterizing that node in the brain as an emotional memory sal salience center, basically. So um, it's one of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, kind of proposed regions that we're looking at now as kind of the integrator. Um, but that's still an open question. So I definitely appreciate it. <laughs> it's a good one. I'm not asking so much where, although that's important. Oh, OK. I'm asking how. And again, how, yeah. Answer, but just the idea of residual signals <clears throat> at the level of downstream receptor activation, neuromodulators presence, or reverberation of a certain, you know, there's a lot of, yeah. a lot of possibilities. Yes, yeah, and we haven't looked at that at all yet, yeah. I would say. No, that's a great question. Okay. <laughs> there. Sorry, what was that question one more time? The neuronal numbers? So we don't see a chain. Right. Right. Uh, oh, so the we don't see a change in number. I showed you that data in the number of CRH neurons. We do see an increase in CRH production. Um, we see an increase in corticosterone, this canonical stress hormone. We see the anhedonia. We see um, memory deficits. We see a lot of different changes. Um, so, and the functional data I showed you was the increased EPSCs uh, in these CRH neurons as well, um, going along with the, the synapse. Uh, increased number. Um, did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> oh, there was someone back there. Darn. <laughs> You're not up there. Yep. Um, so I was wondering if you, um, in your microglial experiments, could yep. you identify another region and do that as a control? Because yep. this is a systemic response because right. Right. It then factors out to an entire stress response. Exactly. It's a great question. We're looking into identifying a control region now. It was going to be the thalamus, but <laughs> the PVT at least is looking interesting, so it might not be a good control region. What's um, interesting, though, I will point out is that there are opposite effects in the hippocampus. So we actually see decreased spine number um, in our hippocampal uh, pyramidal cells after early life adversity. So that suggests to me that it's not necessarily a systemic, like all the microglia are, you know, sleepy or not doing their job. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So thinking of a different uh, thalamic nucleus that we yeah, could look and at. And that brings in the idea of the, you know, whether or not there is a gene activation right. of this right. that is separate from actually what's neurally encoded. Exactly. If yeah. You, you know, if you, if you do just general anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, we don't think it's an inflammatory process what's happening, um, and Beth Stevens has shown that as well. We don't see changes in IL-1 beta or any of the canonical cytokines that people, that I looked at as a, as a PhD student um, after air pollution exposure and those things. So it, it doesn't really seem like that's the case.